Um, all right. Um, my name is Frederick Johnson. I um, am a graduate student working on a master's degree in history, and I got an assistantship, a graduate assistantship with the Center for Teaching and Learning, where we, I don't, we called me the graduate assistant for OER. I, I, my assistantship was specifically intended to be uh, a person whose only job was to support the OER initiative at Boise State. Um, and I think part of that comes because I already came and with a background in libraries and with a master's in library science. So I already kind of had a mindset. I was already kind of predisposed to, to be able to, you know, help people look for and find uh, resources for instruction. So just adapted that to finding and applying OER. Right. Okay. And I'm gonna. I, so let me give a little more context here to the whole, to the kind of a bigger picture here. Um, so in my position over at the CTL, I'm an instructional designer, um, and the director had been requested by the provost to kind of look into this thing called OER. Um, and so we got together um, and decided, well, maybe um, this is bigger than one person. Uh, <laughs> Uh, whole idea of open is sharing information and, and building, uh, maybe building a community around a topic or some, something of that nature. And so uh, they kind of thought, well, we can't really, we don't have the infrastructure or the budget to hire someone right this moment. Um, and so what if we were able to fund uh, a GA position? Uh, so it wasn't long after that um, we put out the word, we were able to hire two, um, one of them being Frederick. Um, and um, at that point, I think in Boise State's OER history, um, although there were a lot of people who were very supportive and heavily involved, uh, some, are, some are still working with us here um, and you've seen uh, at the conference this week and some of whom have gone on to other things, um, but uh, the community is still very vibrant and it's growing at Boise State. Um, so this, but the Center for Teaching and Learning uh, kind of needed, um, somebody other than an instructional designer. So, cause OER was a very, uh, supposed to be a very small part of what I do. It has grown into something very, very much larger than uh, I think maybe was intended at first. Um, and that's fine because the needs there and that's what the Center for Teaching and Learning does is pursue aspects of pedagogical development and, and so forth that the face-to-face -face community or really any, any uh, teaching community at Boise State is looking for. We are fortunate as we went on through the years, not only to have Frederick along, but we gained uh, people like Monica Brown over in campus, um, uh, Rob Nyland, uh, Jonathan Lashley. They also came in in different positions, but were very supportive of where we are. And of course we had uh, Mimo Cordova, uh, Amber Sherman, uh, Elizabeth Shook. Um, there are lots of people uh, in the OER community at Boise State in various positions and such. So when we were looking for a GA, we had done a little research and found that other institutions were successful in um, using GAs to help faculty kind of get over the hurdle of, oh, it's gonna take so long, I don't have time, um, and actually do some of the research for them. And what we intended to do was use Frederick um, and the other GA as people who faculty could use as a resource to go, how do I find this stuff? Um, and so, that's kind of the why we did it. Um, and I want Frederick to talk about, if you can if you can dig back into your memory a little bit um, and talk about the early days. We're gonna get to what happened more recently, which gets a little exciting with the pandemic and all. But, um, but what was it like when you first started? What would you describe the atmosphere, the work environment, the OER, the level of OER uh, engagement at that time? Well, there was a... Um... There was certainly energy in our little section of the Center for Teaching and Learning. But when I came in, um, I didn't even, I mean, I think our interview started with uh, you and our uh, mutual boss 
explaining to me what OER was. And I, as the, as it dawned on me, as, and I mean, and as I understood that name to a concept that I was, that I already kind of understood, um, I got excited, but we started out, I mean, we started out that first year, there were two of us. That's, that's right. There were two graduate assistants. And, and we started out first by trying to identify, you know, high impact courses for OER adoption. So we were kind of looking, we started kind of at the big picture, right? So, what's so that's what I remember starting was we were starting by looking at seeing where we, you know, we were trying to look at where we could have the biggest impact through um, adoptions. From there, what does that mean? What was what was it? Oh well, we were looking at so we were looking at things like we were looking at things like the we were trying to make um, connections with uh, the sciences, biology in particular, um, where there are literally hundreds and hundreds of biology students and biology lab students every semester. So, so large lecture courses with expensive textbooks from- With expensive textbooks. Yeah, so we were kind of juggling, exactly. We were kind of juggling, you know, so first we were kind of identifying these things, um, but I don't know if we made, you know, I don't know if we were making huge inroads, but, but we kept identifying these people. I know that between me and the other GA and you, you know, we were, meeting with members of departments and things. And, and a lot of it was mostly planting seeds, you know, it, it, but, and, you know, so I can't say that at first we had some great success because I don't know if we did. It was more like trying to build up momentum, but, it, but I think we did because eventually, you know, a name would come up, it, you know, as we were talking with people, word would get out and then somebody would reach out. And um, so that was kind of where we started. And then it seemed, then, then our efforts kind of shifted as um, a few faculty began to pop up and were interested. I mean, there were, that we already had um, uh, Professor Jones who was writing an art history book. <clears throat> And, you know, I, and they were working on things in theater and stuff. But then um, I think our, one of our biggest coups was um, a, a young and dynamic uh, professor in the biology department who was like, hey, I'm all over this. And uh, uh, Dr. Meredith. Mm -hmm. And her husband teaches also at Boise State, in, in, also in the sciences. And so, and they're both, you know, dynamic and energetic. And so then, I mean, I don't know if we kind of did it together, if I did it exactly, I can't remember. And, and I had your approval and your blessing, but I kind of shifted my focus to, hey, you know what? Let's focus on these people that are energized. We're already getting the word out. We're already working on talking to departments and de department deans and, 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 uh, you, Bob, are really good at this, you know, and, and kind of doing PR with the school newspaper and stuff. So while that was going on, I began to go ahead and focus more with the people who were starting to show enthusiasm and really encourage them and help them find stuff. Because I think at that point, those people were going to be the best ones to get colleagues on board, you know. Instead so, of us, uh, instead of us coming from the outside, now we had an ally inside departments. Right. And notably, right. this notably the biology department is the easiest example. So, um, right, and so <clears throat> we kind of changed, shifted gears a little bit, took a step back from trying to convert whole classes because, because of course we knew how awesome OER was, and we thought everybody would just follow line, and this is really great. Um, but uh, not being faculty full time, um, I think you know, one of the things I underestimated maybe was the time commitment back when, back in the early days. Um, and so since I have learned not only from my own class, but from lots of feedback that there is, you know, we obviously know that that is a big 
roadblock, hoop, uh, hurdle, concern for faculty is where they're going to find the time. And so we kind of adopted this take smaller bites approach. Um, and where you and, and the other GA were very helpful in um, finding bits and pieces for, for instructors who were interested. Um, and of course, you were very helpful in, um, in that you attended uh, faculty learning communities, community of practices, um, whether they be faculty or uh, you know, staff, um, which we still have those meetings uh, running to this day. Uh, thanks to um, Monica Brown and, and Amber Hoy and others. Um, yeah, and, so. and that was a lot of, that was a lot of fun for me. And that was where I, you know, I mean, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know who's listening or who might get the word out, but to me, it seems like that's where it was fun for me and where other institutions might find value in having someone like a graduate assistant who can focus on OER. Because the fun thing for me was, I could say, you know, as we talk to professors who are like, oh, I don't know if I can do this, I'd say, ah, but I'll tell you what, I can do this and this for you, or I can be working on this. And so I think we were able to, I think we were able to help mitigate that for some people who were interested, but were concerned about the heavy lifting. Um, but it, it is something that gains momentum. You know, it's like anything else. Once you, once you get working on it and, and once, you know, they say the first time you teach the class is the hardest, right? The first time you make this shift because you're doing all the nitty gritty work. But every time after your workload is lessened because then you're just fine tuning. You've got the, but yeah. And I would say that that was also, you know, I would say that also that was our biggest challenge with faculty. I don't know if you'd agree, but um, the thing I, the thing I admire most about teachers, whether public education or higher education, is that it's, it's their strength and it's, it can also be their weakness, is that they, are, they, are, they have an independent streak. You know, when they find stuff that works and when they have a system, they, they like to keep to it, you know, when they find out what works. And so they can be reluctant to, you know, make changes that feel um, this big. So right. it, it was it was a it was a really gratifying part of my work to help mitigate that fear a little bit and help show professors and other faculty that hey this is uh, this is you're already doing this mm -hmm. we're just we're just helping show you some new some new resources that you can do to do what you're already doing so it was right. neat but I I do think that that. That, I would say that was probably one of the biggest challenges is talking about time and, and talking about change. Professors can have a hard time changing. To their credit, I don't, to their credit, sometimes it's, you know, sometimes they're right. They and know. That, was, that was our experience. Uh, so, you, you know, your, mile, your miles may vary, um, you know, your institution based on the institution's culture and, and so forth. So, um, and I say that the reason that I found the professors were, were sometimes reluctant um, was because, you know, they had stuff, like Frederick said, that worked, that they knew the students were grasping the concepts. Um, and so it wasn't for, for lack of wanting to try something new or looking into something because it's, that's part of the learning process. And most, I would say 99.9% .9 of people who teach are, are lifelong learners. And so they're always kind of looking and considering, you know, what's around the corner? Is that a better situation? And, and will it convey information in a way that the students can take it in and, in a way and receive it? Um, so at I, the I, sorry, I agree. I do think that educators do like learning, but they, they are sometimes, they can sometimes be a little bit cautious if they don't find the new thing themselves. You know, sometimes they're reluctant when somebody else says, hey, do this, this is the best thing ever. And so, it, like I say, it goes both ways. I, not, I don't mean to say that, that professors don't and that instructors aren't looking for better ways to teach because they are, but I, I know that for a lot of them, they kind of need to feel like, like they've discovered it on their own. You know, okay, they don't, they need to kind of do that. So that, so I hope, anyway, I hope that makes sense and that, that it's clear that I, I think professors are the greatest. <laughs> they really do. I think what they do is amazing. I think you're fine. I think you're fine. I think everybody kind of gets where you're going with that. Um, and I would say that your personality, your um, skill set, including your uh, librarian, um, 
you know, knowledge and ideas and, um, you know, experience played a big role into them accepting what you found for them. Um, and so that was something where we felt when you, when we came across your particular resume or application, we thought, well, he's a history major now, so he knows about archival practices and things like that. But look at this, he has an MLS degree and he's done library work and so forth and so on. So um, in a lot of ways, even though one of your first questions was what's OER or, or whatever during the interview, or we you know, had to kind of explain what OER was, a lot of people were asking. So I don't think it was, uh, we expected that during the interviews, but what was golden was that you're, you, you had that library experience and that played out with the faculty from what I saw. Um, and so kind of to kind of change gears a little bit, uh, of course, you know, when the university does something, they invest in someone or something like a, a GA ship and, and then that process uh, ends or even during the process, we want to review, did we, did, did we do what we intended to do? Um, what was the impact of, of hiring Frederick and, and the um, other graduate assistant? And so each semester we estimated that uh, the GAs impacted Boise State students by saving them almost $100,000 in, in traditional text cost. So over the course of three years, that's oh, well over half a million dollars in textbook costs. It costs the university a fraction, a small fraction, um, probably too small according to Frederick, uh, you know, for us to reimburse his tuition, that's part of the process. And, you know, there was, a, uh, you, know, uh, you know, his paycheck, obviously. Um, and, and maybe some health uh, insurance thrown in there as well. So these are all things that were expend, expended to get the person or the GA into the position. And so the problem that we might have is that those funds are temporary or they're not always available. Or you can't always do it at your institution. And so I just wanna throw this out there. Um, now we're considering other ways to do kind of what Frederick has done. Um, we, we may not get someone with the qualifications, uh, may not have another GA for a while, but Student workers can can be helpful. This and they're not they're not they're not as expensive um, as a GA or and um, there's work study. And I know people say, well, work study you know has some guidelines and some ideas that are also difficult to navigate. But um, at the same time, um, the funding doesn't usually at least at Boise State the way it works. It doesn't come from your your budget directly. Um, and and so there's some training involved and there's some. Um, you know, rotation of student workers and um, uh, students who are working with um, work study funds. However, um, what happens is, is that it does take a long, long time to do this research. And so if a faculty has a direction they're going in um, and whether it's open pedagogy or a text, um, and we focus on text because we thought that was the lowest hanging fruit at the time. Um, and now I would say we'd kind of focus on a little bit wider, um, well, we, we, we widen our focus um, so speaking of widening focus and getting, uh, you know, return on investment, um, that's why I bring up the hundred thousand dollars savings. It was $97,500 is what we, it was a low ball estimate. Um, so how do we get that figure? We estimated that the average text cost was $65. Um, and we had various surveys and polls, um, and, uh, direct information from instructors that, hey, I've replaced this book, I've replaced that book. And so uh, through a somewhat complicated formula, uh, determine what the average cost would, would be and then what the average uh, savings would be and then kind of lump that together based on class size and uh, frequency of the sections being offered. So we have about five minutes left of, of, of this particular topic. And I wanna get to uh, if people have any kind of questions that they wanna ask uh, Frederick or me uh, about the GA ship. Um, and that would include, um, you know, if you don't have to be the GA of OER. If you're a GA in a department that's helping a department with instruction in some way, um, OER is just one of many tools. So speaking of helping with instruction, Frederick was with us up until the end. Uh, what I mean by that, up until last March. Um, and, and, and a little beyond that, actually. Um, so he saw the CTL just, and, and eCampus and, and Learning Technology Solutions are, are technology people for instruction, uh, pivot with the instructors uh, to get everybody to teach you know, remotely. Um, and, and how did that impact you? What was, walk us through that, Frederick, and, and what, well, how did that work with OER? Yeah, well, let me, 
I want to go back and just make a quick comment on something you were talking about just a moment ago too quickly, you know, talking about student workers, just to give you my perspective and for anyone that's listening who might be considering this. And this might have been in part because of Boise State. This might have been in part because I'm obviously a non-traditional student. I'm a little bit older than, than a lot of graduate students. Just a little, yeah. I know, no, it really isn't that much. But, um, but I want to say I would want to encourage people to consider graduate assistants and student employees to help with OER because I think having the perspective of a student, I mean, you and your colleagues at the CTL obviously were interested in, you know, kind of how I had one foot in kind of seeing the faculty side of things, but also as a student. And I think that um, not only would OER initiatives at other institutions benefit from having the extra help at a lower cost that comes through students, but if they're open to it, they're, they're also, um, you know, if they do as you did and included me in meetings and in discussions and in, you know, certain policy questions and things, there's an opportunity for real valuable insight to the people who are, who ultimately we're doing this for, right? I mean, it impacts everybody, it impacts the professors, but ultimately our mission is to provide the best education at the best cost, right, for students. So, so anyway, I just have to give that plug for students. Good. Um, you got two minutes. All right, I can probably do this faster. I mean, the it was interesting because around January, February, suddenly I almost never saw you or our other colleague, Dr. Madsen. Um, and I was used to talking to you and seeing you, you all the time. At that time, I was busy. I was, I was also busy working, finishing uh, another one of our colleagues with uh, an OER book, which was, as you said, the last year we went from we went to actually encouraging people to produce some OER. So I was focused on that, but things, there was a sense of motion and action. There was a buzz. I felt something intense in the air and I wasn't, I knew it was big because I didn't see people as much and I wasn't, you know, a lot of the meetings we normally had that I normally went to changed or were canceled or were, you know, but I came away so with so much respect for the work that the instructional designers do and the Center for Teaching and Learning does. I mean, I saw, and from my perspective, having a little bit of, being a little bit of a fly on the wall, I was amazed that Boise State was ready to close, was ready to organize way ahead of the state of Idaho, way ahead of anybody else. And so, I actually feel like I personally and my family personally were, were kind of prepared for what eventually happened with COVID because the CTL was a couple of weeks at least ahead of anyone else, it seemed like, in, the, in government or anywhere else. They just were ready for anything. Well, thank you for that. I wasn't really fishing for the praise. What I was looking for was and I, and I think you 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 capitalize in cap it's in capitalizing what you're saying um, even if I can't talk um, uh, that there was and it's time but we're going to wrap this up real quick there was a push not only for how do you do online instruction or remote instruction because um, online at Boise State has a, a larger connotation and more structure to it than remote does um, and so we had to pivot to remote real quick and there was a a lot of interest in OER. So I did kind of di disappear because I was finding OER like there was no tomorrow for people to push things to through that they couldn't normally, or whatever whatever reason, didn't normally do face-to-face. -face. So it was an odd transition. Um, and you know, maybe that's a silver lining. There's some odd silver linings to a situation, a tragic situation, um, just like it reveals um, inequities that have always been there, but now they're easier to see in this situation. But what happens is, um, uh, that was a that was a you know as for everyone a huge huge transition. So um, anyway, it is time. I want to thank uh, Frederick for being with us, and hopefully he shared some um, insights for all of you. Um, we will have this recording, and all the other recordings are available um, 
uh, and I'll, I'll put that again, it's in the chat right now and we'll uh, put that up on our site. I just wanna thank all the presenters. Uh, we're gonna wrap things up here and I'm gonna share my screen and just say thank you to my colleagues who were absolutely amazing um, in putting this whole thing together. Um, and so if you can, you can, you can see them up there um, just from whether they gave a talk, a discussion, a panel, um, or we're just there for moral support and helping all of us put together um, what we hope was a useful um, sessions uh, for, for everyone. Um, and so these are the things that are also available that are on demand. They'll be up uh, for the foreseeable future. And so please take advantage of these. If you have any questions, um, you can also reach us by going to our main site. Um, and so once again, thank you so much for being with us. We hope that the uh, Open uh, Education Week was enjoyable. And um, feel free to share my email also, Bob, I'm, in case if anyone has a question, I'll be happy to answer it. All right. So once, feel once free again, to share my email too. Thank, thank you, you for this opportunity. You're very welcome, Frederick. Thank you for, for being with us. Um, Kristen, uh, do you have anything else to add? Or does anybody else? No, just want to thank everyone once again. And please do check out our on-demand content, which is and our recordings, which are, as Bob said, all posted on our conference homepage. Thank you so much for coming. Bye, everyone. <laughs>